TypeScript Congress is almost here. Mark your calendars for September 21st and 22nd to connect with the vibrant TypeScript community and learn more about everything from tooling to testing. GitNation were kind enough to connect us with the speakers so we could learn more about them and their talks at the conference. Today we will be talking with Ryan Kavanagh from the Microsoft TypeScript team, someone I've interacted with many times over the past decade, but surprisingly this was the first time that we were on a call together. I hope you are as excited as I am to hear his thoughts, so let's go. Hello Ryan, thank you for joining us. Uh, can you give a brief introduction of yourself and your background in TypeScript? This is a very interesting question to ask you. I feel like I'm asking Anders and the response will be like, yeah, I created it. But the viewers might not know and I'm also interested to hear your thoughts. Yeah, um, I'm Ryan Kavanaugh. Uh, I'm currently the dev lead for the TypeScript project at Microsoft. Um, let's see, I came to TypeScript back in 2012. Um, I was uh, looking around for a new job and uh, wanted to learn JavaScript, and I started trying to learn JavaScript, and I was really used to statically typed languages, um, and I was like pretty disappointed by the state of JavaScript tooling at the time, and felt like, hey, I, I could really use a, um, I didn't have the words yet for it, but I was I was saying to myself, I could really use a type checker for this language, it would really help me out. Um, and then by chance, I was in a meeting with uh, Luke Hoban and Bill Heishurst, and they had mentioned the TypeScript project, and I said, hey, um, can I come work on that? It, it sounds like it was just a bizarre experience to like, you know, the previous night I was banging my head against the wall on some typo I had in my code. And then the next day I go into this meeting and they're like, Hey, we have this tool working on to find typos in your JavaScript code more or less. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I joined on as a tester back then and was, um, uh, I set up the, the baseline tests and the four slash tests that we still use today. So that's really cool. Um, got really involved with just kind of every aspect of the language and, um, uh, the rest is sort of history, I guess. Um, I've just been doing the TypeScript thing ever since. Perfect. I know you, your, uh, journey, your TypeScript journey also started very early. Um, yes, at the same time. So I turned 12 when it, as soon as it became public, at the same, not at the same time, but as soon as it became public, yeah. uh, I jumped on it. And the reason for me was actually looking at uh, the success of C Sharp. And I was impressed with John Skeet. And I was like, if a new language comes out from Microsoft, I would love to learn it and share knowledge on that. And that's mm -hmm. why I got in early. Yeah, I mean, you're 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 famous among the team as like the OG TypeScript guy who's who's been here since day one, and um, it's it's really cool to have you in this position right now. Cool, thank you so much. Uh, what is the topic of your talk at TypeScript Congress, and what inspired you to choose this particular subject? Um, the topic of my talk is uh, the, the title is "Let's Make an Inference Algorithm." Um, something that I. I it has inspired me when I, I, I look at other languages and, and the, the people who've worked on them is when they're able to um, walk you through how some process works in a way that um, demystifies it or, or brings clarity to a process that has historically been like very opaque um, as someone who's like maybe not an expert in the field. So um, this is my attempt to do that same thing, but for TypeScript and talk about how generic inference works, because I, I think the... Um, it, you know, as much as TypeScript's type system is complicated these days, I think from the early days, uh, simplicity and the idea that you could explain how something worked and you could just follow along as a human has been a, a design goal for us. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe not explicitly, but implicitly, right? Like you want you want the computer to be doing stuff that you're like, oh yeah, I can I can predict what it's going to do because I know um, roughly how it works. Um, and and I haven't ever seen someone explain. This particular aspect of TypeScript, um, so I thought it would be fun to um, sit down, walk through something that I, I think most people just kind of take as a—I um, a, don't want to say take for granted, but like if you're writing some generic function call, some type parameter appears up the output side, and you're like, "Well, how did that get there?" Um, and you know, as, as long as it's correct, you're like, "Yeah, okay, I, I'm just going to move on with my life." Like there are lots of parts of my computer I don't know how they work, right? Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so I, I thought that would be really fun. And the other thing I wanted to show in the talk uh, is that when we're, as we're evolving the language, we're always looking at like the use cases and like what it, what is the code that, um, you know, flashback to 2013, right? Like you write some code in 2013 and it doesn't work the way you want it to. Um, mm -hmm. What are the examples that like drive the language in terms of this example really should do this behavior, but instead it has this other behavior? Because I, I think for every feature... Um, every change we've ever done, there's always been some, um, maybe not just exactly one, like one true code sample to drive the language, but uh, there's always something where, where 
you know the code that you're going to put in the blog post as soon as you start working on the feature because you can say, uh, yeah, until we did X, Y didn't work. And, mm -hmm. and you cannot, you, we have that, that mental model of like, the reason we're doing this feature is, is to make this code work. The benefits. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, what are some challenges that you've seen developers face when working with TypeScript and how could they overcome them? That's a great question. Um, I, I, it's, it's hard for me not to just think about that in terms of where to, I'm always thinking about what's next for the language and, and trying to, to do things in that direction. I, I think most people are not probably encountering language limitations on a day-to-day -day basis though. I mm -hmm. hope. Um, I so, agree. What's that? I agree. I think the friction yeah. is when you're starting off with TypeScript, but once you're in it, it becomes very natural, especially if you don't necessarily go with the complicated types. And a lot of people don't. They're mm -hmm. mostly using the basic types and the complicated types are really there for the libraries. Yeah. Uh, but that initial friction of jumping in, I think, is what people struggle with most. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think getting set up is something that's really hard across the JavaScript ecosystem right now because um, there's all these tools to create starter apps. You end up with like a million files in your repo root and you're like, which which of these do I need? Which do I not need? Um, and, and I see it in other tools too, right? Like I, I set up a um, like a, I set up 11 D the other day and it was like, um, it created, you know, 30 files. I'm like, what do all these files do? And I go read the docs and there's just too many words that I haven't seen before. Um, so I want to just like, I, I think it'd be nice if we had a way to help people get their feet wet, um, with like less conceptual overloading. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know what that looks like, especially cause like, as much as we're all about JavaScript and JavaScript is a web language, JavaScript is, is an everywhere language too, but like we're not web people for the most part, right? Like mm -hmm. I think only a couple of people on the team have like made websites professionally for more than a, a few months, right? So mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's where uh, I, I'd love the community to always be engaged in this because they're the ones with the, the full broader context and we're really just here to provide the niche context on our particular corner. I think another thing that's happening quite a lot nowadays is that TypeScript is perhaps the first language they interact with and one of the key friction points that you get as soon as you jump into TypeScript is like, hey, before you can use TypeScript effectively, you need to know JavaScript. And then they're like, mm -hmm. okay, I have two documentation pieces that I need to juggle. So that's yeah. true for beginners as well. Yeah, uh, it's TypeScript... funny because when, when, we wrote, when we wrote the handbook, um, it was like, uh, hey, we, we're just going to set... Um, the first time we wrote the handbook, we're like, we'll explain a little mm -hmm. bit of JavaScript as we go, um, just to set context. And then we realized quickly that like the JavaScript language is too big to effectively teach at the same time as TypeScript. And now the handbook tries really hard to only talk about TypeScript stuff. But, um, as you point out, if you're just jumping into TypeScript and you only read the handbook, you're going to be sitting there asking yourself, what's a const? What's a let? What's a var? What's a function? Are these passed yeah. by value? These passed by reference? Like so many quite like, what is async about? What's the deal with that? And, um, you know, for scoping reasons, we want to not talk about that stuff. It's, it's It can be very confusing and overwhelming. Yeah. Um, but um, I, I don't know what the right place to point people for a, a, an all-up uh, explanation is. And I, I don't even know if that's the right thing, you know. Um, I agree. It, it I think it could be and, and maybe long-term because um, you're going to find, you're going to encounter JavaScript code, you know, no matter how successful TypeScript is, JavaScript code will always be there. You're always going to have to be able to reason about it, like what, what code without type annotations means. Um, so it, it, it's a tricky problem, and um, I'm, I'm curious where, what the state of learning will be 10 years from now. Yeah. One thing that I really like about the TypeScript team is that they don't make their opinions publicly known and enforce them, because like, anything you say will sort of get enforced and be held as like the Bible. Um, and th w not pointing to a JavaScript documentation is another example of that because you're focused on TypeScript. This is how TypeScript works. JavaScript, there's lots of excellent sources. I think MDN is an excellent one that is publicly maintained. Mm -hmm. um, so let the people do their own research on how to build their foundation. Yeah. TypeScript has evolved and it is evolving. Is there a feature that you really love or would like to see in the future? Oh boy. You don't, don't have to if I this say it, people are going to be like, well, it's happening, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Something that you really love in the past. Um, what have I really loved in the past? That's a good question. Um, I love all our features. Um, <laughs> I think um, the two things that stand out to me 
uh, as as features that I thought were really well done were uh, conditional types and map types. Um, I love it, love them as well. Yeah, those are both um, Anders' brain children. Where we didn't know the the story for me begins with um, uh, I forget what it was twenty sixteen or so, and, and React was getting really big, and React uh, class based React was really big, and you had this mm-hmm. set state function, and that set state was so important because it was the the interaction model that you had to to you know for half of your your app state. Um, and people would initialize their state in the constructor or in the, as a field initializer. And then they needed to call set state. And that was this partially updating function where you could give it some subset of what you had, right? And, mm-hmm. um, people wanted, um, a way to say, given some object type, give me the equivalent type with all the properties made optional. Um, very logical thing to do. And, mm-hmm. Everyone thought about that in terms of like, we need an operator that does exactly that. There should just be a optionalify option. Maybe it looks like, you know, optionalify T or something. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, if it was probably me in charge of the language, we, we, I think we would have done that. I, I'll say. I, I think flow has that as a, as a base construct instead of something more low level like map types. Yeah, and, and it makes sense to have in the language because it's such a common thing. Uh, there are lots of operations that we have that I think you could today at least rephrase in terms of other operators. Um, but anyway, Anders looked at that and said, um, you know, he just kind of stares at it with his Anders brain for a while and says, oh no, what you need is this higher level operation that can do all sorts of other transforms. And and now you see things that can, um, y- you know, every library with complex typings relies on map types and, and can make all these wild transforms that they need to do all this crazy stuff and it's great. Um, and then conditional types just slot in very cleanly to that, where um, you need to make some decision based on something. Um, and I think it's pretty remarkable because we, we made conditional types. Uh, again, Andrews came up with this, and it felt like completely out of left field at the time, and now it just feels like the most natural thing ever in the language. Um, and uh, the thing that really stuck out to me was, like, I would go through all of our old suggestions, um, and I was like, wait, this this one feature that we added as complex as it is, has solved dozens and dozens and dozens of other suggestions that were like, oh yeah, we need a, a specific type operator that does like exactly this. And you're like, oh wait, no, it's just a conditional type with an infer. And you can do so, you can solve so many problems at once with the same thing. And I think that's just so, um, it, it's really gratifying when you see that happen in the language because it means mm-hmm. that you're not, you're adding one concept instead of a dozen concepts and it's less, Frankly, less implementation work, um, but it's also less less work for people learning the language and less stuff to understand. So, um, that's great. I'm subscribed to so many original one of the original issues on uh, TypeScript, and I see a lot of them get closed, got closed with when the map types came out and when the conditional types came out. And yeah. it's also interesting for me to see that um, the thing that I observed, which is that the conditional types were added after map types, which is like when you were building a language, you think of if first before you think of loops. But with this, it's loops first, and then we got the conditional types. And yeah, really I also like the the clever use of never within conditional types for for type deletion. That that mm-hmm. always feels like a, an interesting portion of the language, nonetheless. Like that that's we have something that removes the existence of any more flow, and we mm-hmm. can use that in conditional types as well. Yeah. It, it's funny because you, we talk about um, you talk about never in a conditional type, and um, I, I think it's a an interesting thing where conditional types are distributive by default, um, mm-hmm. which I think a lot of people disagree with, or at least people who have maybe thought too hard about conditional types disagree with it. Um, but if you go back to the we saw we are trying to solve code examples, uh, if you think about conditional types as being the type equivalent of an if statement, it's like, if you call a function twice with like one value and then the other value, you're gonna go down mm-hmm. one branch of the if or the other branch of the if, um, and the results, you know, you'll, you'll get those two things out. So it's like, in the same sense that like, an iterative, you know, subsequent calls of the same function effectively distribute over the values that they've been given. Um, yep. And conditional types by default distribute the same way because they're trying to mimic that if statement in a way. I mean, um, 
be, well, the other thing is like, we tried it without distributivity and it was like, okay, if we don't have this, then you're going to have to, you'll be reminding people for the rest of your life. You forgot to make this distributive. You should have. Um, um, but it really does come down to the, the to the same, to the same way that like mapped types are a distributive application over object properties. Uh, conditional mm -hmm. types are a distributive operation over unions because we think of unions as being, um, um, I mean, maybe the most theoretical, the most grounded application of this is like inside a function body, you can't, inside a generic function body, you can't tell what the types are and you can't tell what the like other possible inhabitants of the type that you're dealing with are. Like if someone hands you the string hello, you can't tell if it was hello, just hello or hello or world, right? So um, mm -hmm. those those things happen. But then, you know, at, at, when the types are always higher order, that's when they tend to not want to be distributed anyway. Yeah. The distribution Going, definitely makes sense to me, personally. Yeah. Going very deep uh, on what are, you and I. <laughs> <laughs> what are you most excited about for the TypeScript Congress? Are there any other speakers or sessions that you're looking forward to? Um, Popular really, answers include hearing from you, just so you know. <laughs> uh, I'm really looking forward to Jake's talk on the module transition. Uh, and I'm really curious to see what people, um, what questions people have, because this is, this was something that um, we've been trying to transition our code base to modules for, for years. Um, it's been, uh, I think I've opened a few of those issues. Yet. What's that? I've opened a few of those issues over time. Like the, the file order is changing the build. It's breaking my extra yeah. weird thing that I've built. Yeah. Um, we've tried a bunch of different approaches. Different people have worked on it over the years. I, I think we first tried in like 2017, if, if not maybe a little later. Um, and uh, the fact that Jake was kind of able to crack the code, I, I think it might, my fear is that it'll be unsatisfying because the way he did it is so obvious in retrospect. Um, so I, I haven't watched his talk yet. I don't know if he's recorded yet, but I'm I'm looking forward to hearing um, how he talks about it um, in a public setting to, to show the motivations and the steps to get there. Um, you know, we, we, we reviewed the code for like, sort of approach correctness. Um, but I want mm -hmm. to understand from him, like what, um, what the, uh, I don't know how he got there just because it was, it's, I have, I, it was a very painful process for us. Um, until just, until Jake just did it. So that was really cool. Yeah. Perfect. Really excited for your talk. Thank you for spending your time with us today and thank you for the viewers tuning in.